Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Shares for beginners. Weekend watch list. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we take a close look at an individual company that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how Stockopedia screens for value. Joining me today is Chris Batchelor, and we're talking Smart Group, ASX code SIQ. G'day, Chris. Hey, Phil, great to be with you again today. I always like to think about companies providing a solution. Tell us about Smart Group. What is the solution that they provide? Yeah, so they do what's called salary packaging services, and along with that, they do novated leasing and fleet management services. So when you first think of that, you think, what on earth does that mean? So salary packaging, for a lot of employers, rather than just paying their uh, employees a wage, they like to do what's called salary packaging. So they add certain benefits for the employee, and that can give the the employee um a benefit which is both tax effective as well as you know something that they want. Uh, often it involves the provision of a vehicle, but there are other elements to it as well. And that can in, uh, help employers to attract and retain talent. Now, it's particularly relevant if you work in the not-for-profit sector or sectors such as government, education, healthcare, uh, charities. You're often able to structure up a lot of your expenses to have them paid out of your pre-tax salary. So that means obviously the amount of cash that you get at your after-tax salary at the end of the day is higher than it would otherwise be. So that's the service that they provide for those sorts of firms. And then novated leases are a form of leasing a car. And fleet management services are, you know, where big companies or big organizations like governments, et cetera, have large fleets of vehicles. And rather than have staff dedicated to managing those fleets, looking after, you know, purchasing, sales, maintenance, insurance, all that kind of thing, they outsource that to a company such as Smart Group who take care of all of that and just make sure that the, the staff have the cars that they need when they need them. Oh, I never realised that. I've got a friend who works in the charity sector and um, he gets a package like this as well with a, with a car included and he was um, glowing about the tax benefits of that. Yes, well, exactly right. I, I worked for an education firm at one stage in my career and I was able to have all manner of different things paid for out of my pre-tax salary. So it is quite effective. So nearly all of Smart Group's clients are from stable and defensive sectors such as health, education and not-for-profit and government. Does this provide some sort of stability to the cash flow? Their clients are big employers and all those organisations you mentioned, they tend to be quite big employers. And so, yes, it tends to be that they sign a contract with a with a firm. So it does include corporates as well, but, you know, whether it's a corporate or a, like a utility or a, or a government department, they sign large contracts and then those contracts play out over a number of years. And so, yeah, that gives stability to the, to the income and cash flow profile of the business. So tell us about the financials. What do they look like? Yeah, indeed. They look very attractive in in summary. Uh, Using our quality ranking, it has a quality ranking of 94. And they released their full year results on February 21. So they report on a calendar year. Overall revenue grew by 12%. However, their overheads also grew by 15%. And that was driven by an increase in staff costs, uh, particularly due to inflation and also increased headcount. They're trying to uh, grow their staff to meet the growing demand from Novated Leasing in particular, and also looking at expanding their in-house IT capability. So the net result of all of that was that EBITDA only increased 7%, and then EPS earnings per share was further reduced, but still an increase of 5%. Now, they've got very strong margins. Margins are around 40% for EBITDA margins, operating margins 36%. Uh, net profit, 25%. So th- these are really solid uh, numbers. And then that's backed up by really high returns on equity and returns on capital, 26% uh, and 29% respectively. If we want to take a look at the balance sheet, which I always do, it's always good to understand a lot of the risks in a business will show up on the balance sheet. In this case, their balance sheet's very solid. They've got a net debt to equity ratio of only 13% and a very low risk of bankruptcy. As we talked at the beginning, strong cash flow. And just interesting to note, you know, there are two main competitors to this business, Macmillan Shakespeare and SG Fleet. 
And again, both of those, SIQ, have the better quality ranking. I'm just trying to get a bit more of a picture of the business. What's the interface like between customers and SIQ? Is it a software as a service style company? Kind of, yeah. So they do have a, a digital interface for their customers to, to use to, and that, that's something that they're really working on. So in terms of, you know, there's sort of two aspects to customers. So the, the customer who pays them is the big organization. But the customer who they are often interacting with is the individual who's leasing the car. So, um, you know, there's, there's those two aspects to it. The individual obviously will want to choose a car that they like and, and meets all their needs and, and they will enter into the arrangement with SG, uh, Smart Group, sorry, not SG Fleet. But in, in terms of, you know, who's paying for the account and all that kind of thing, that's the big organisation that the individual works for. You can, by the way, do uh, novated leasings for small businesses, so that they will have some like small business clients. Sometimes people set up a, a small company with just a couple of people, and as part of it, they will do a novated lease for the staff. Um, so you know they can have small clients as well. And what's been the main driver of the business in recent times? Yeah, so the leasing business or the novated leasing business for them as well as across the industry has really been driven by EVs, electric vehicles. Uh, and the reason for that is a change that was made to the fringe benefit tax where EVs were exempted from fringe benefits tax and, and other low emissions vehicles. And that's made it really attractive to lease these types of vehicles. For example, you can lease, say, a $66,000 Tesla, and it will effectively cost you about the same to own and operate as leasing a $40,000 Mazda. So that's made the EV a far more competitive option. And so what we've found in 2023, EVs made up 7.2% of total new car sales, and that was double what they were in 2022. But if you look at Smart Group, in the most recent half, EVs made up 41% of their leasing book, or for the whole year, they made up 36%. And the numbers are similar for their competitors, not quite as high, but still you know, in, in the mid to high 30s for those other two firms. What we're seeing is, particularly in the corporate sector, over half of the new orders for car leases are now for EVs. And then even for it, sectors like education and, and hospitals, it's above 30% and growing. And the reason for that is more and more affordable EVs are coming on the market. Some of the cheaper Chinese EVs are, are you know, becoming available. And so we're seeing this real trend towards driving EVs and, and particularly towards leasing them because it is such an effective option and you effectively get a arguably nicer car, a you know, more expensive car for the same outlay. Are you picking shares on gut instinct, buying on press tips or rumours? Do you struggle to find the time to keep up with the research and analysis that goes into evaluating potential stocks? Stockopedia are pleased to offer a special deal to listeners of this podcast, a 14-day free trial and a 10% discount on the first year of membership. Sign up now at y.stockopedia.com slash sfb. There's no better time to access the most comprehensive, easy-to-use investing toolbox for DIY share investors. 10% off, 14-day free trial, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's why.stockopedia.com slash sfb. Something we haven't talked about on the podcast is the stock rank style, and um, that's one of the measures up there on the top left of the Stockopedia page. And it's about the ranking, that uh, the overall ranking that uh, Stockopedia assigns to a, a company. Why does Smart Group rank as a high flyer and what is a high flyer? As you may well be aware, listeners may be aware, we have a number of components to our stock ranks. So we generally quote the overall stock rank. Uh, in, in the case of um, Smart Group, that's 89, their stock rank at the moment. But that's made up of three components, quality, value and momentum. And in the case of Smart Group, it has a high quality score of 94. It has a high momentum score also of 94. However, it has a fairly modest value score of 45. And those terms like high flyer, the styles, they come from the combination of the different factor scores. So in this case, you've got high quality, you've got high momentum, 
but lower value. And that's why it's uh, classified as a high flyer. If it was high across all three, then we call it a super stock. But because value's lower, um, we, we call it a high flyer. And basically what it means is it's, it's a really quality business, charging along, going very well. However, if you're a value investor and you're looking for something on the cheap, this might not be the one for you. As always, there's so many companies that we talk about and the value score is quite low. <laughs> yeah, well, with the market hitting highs on a regular basis at the moment, it's not easy for a value investor to find stuff that's going to be attractive to them. So what's the outlook for the company? Yeah, so the outlook is pretty positive. There's an expectation that the momentum in revenue and earnings that we saw in the second half of 2023 will continue into 2024. There's a forecast for EPS growth of 13%. As we mentioned, you have a reasonably good amount of visibility on their future cash flows. In particular, they've got you know orders on their books, so they've got leasing orders. People have ordered cars and those cars have yet to be delivered. Um, as, as you're probably well aware, there's still big delays in terms of cars being delivered, not as bad as it was, but still we're looking at almost 80 days in um, wait times for, for cars. I have a friend who did a novated lease through his employer back in September. He ordered a Ford and here we are now, beginning of April, he's still waiting for that car to arrive. Um, his was with F SG Fleet, but it's the same issue across the industry. Long wait times for cars are improving since the COVID supply bottlenecks have started to ease, but that's still nothing like what it was in the pre-COVID world. But the other thing is they, they also signed large contracts. So, for example, they've signed a big contract with the South Australian government, and that's due to commence in July. So that will be a, you know, a source of uh, ongoing revenue that, that kicks in from that point. So we have quite good visibility on their, on their future revenue, and at this stage, it's looking quite attractive. And this company has its, uses the calendar year for reporting. And so that means that the AGM will be coming up in May if anyone's interested in that kind of thing. It's a bit out of sync, isn't it, to, um, to other companies that yeah, that's are in AGM season in October and so forth, yeah? That's correct. Yeah, we do have a number of companies on the market that uh, do their full year reports at December, but the majority, of course, are in June. Do you ever go to um, annual general meetings? I have done in the past. And then during COVID, when they started um, broadcasting them online, I t tuned into quite a lot. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I haven't, I've been a bit busy in recent times. But yeah, it is good to go along. And particularly, I really liked the whole online thing because you didn't have to leave your own home. And sometimes, you know, the meetings are in other cities and so forth. But you were able to tune in and, and you can even vote and ask questions and things like that. Yeah, that's the sort of thing we leave to the Australian Shareholders Association to, to yeah. advocate on our behalf, which is great. Yeah, yeah. How about the risks moving forward? I mean, you mentioned other companies. Do, do they um, pose any risk to SIQ? Uh, it, yeah, it is a competitive environment. I mean, we mentioned those three listed companies. There are also other uh, non-listed leasing companies. Uh, I think the biggest gr group is actually Toyota. They have their own leasing arm. However, th probably the biggest risk that all of these businesses face is regulatory risk. Uh, as we mentioned, the government changed the rules around FBT. Now, in that case, that was a real positive for the industry and made uh, leasing, particularly EVs, far more attractive. However, governments can change rules in other directions as well, and that could have a negative impact. There was a big uh, issue for the industry back in 2019 uh, as we were coming up to an election at that time labor were in opposition and one of the things that they were proposing had they won that election was to make some um, significant changes to the the rules around salary packaging and, and leasing in particular to make it a lot less attractive and so that had a real negative impact on the share prices of these business but of course labor didn't win that particular election and, and by the time we got to the most recent one they'd changed their tune but you know that's the sort of whims of politics that the, these businesses are, are subject to they're also of course subject to economic risks and and things to do with the sales of new cars you know anything that impacts the demand for new cars will impact the demand for the leasing of new cars and so you know, that will um, potentially have a negative impact. Right now, new car sales are, are going well and are starting to grow, but for many years they were in decline. 
and so that has a flow-on effect uh, for this business. And then, of course, as we've already mentioned, the whole uh, issues around supply chain. So right now you've got this problem of you know trying to get cars to people once they've ordered them. Uh, that's starting to abate, but it's still still a factor that's affecting them. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is too, I mean, most people will be aware that Secondhand car prices really skyrocketed over the last couple of years. Um, I mean, I noticed that the car I bought five years ago, I could have sold it last year for more than what I'd paid for it, which is ridiculous. <laughs> you know? but, um, but what that means for a, a company such as this is that you know, part of their costing is how much will they get for the car at the end of the life of the lease. And if that's a lot more than they would have uh, factored in, then, then that's a positive for the business. So, yeah, there's quite a few factors at play, a lot of which are outside of their immediate control. So, Chris, do you have any final thoughts on Smart Group? Uh, one thing I'd just throw in is we did talk about it, but the value score is quite low. It has improved since they released their most recent results, but still only 45. They got on a forecast PE ratio of 17, which is, I wouldn't say it's attractive, but it's, it's not ridiculously high either. But they do have a pay a fully frank dividend and it's currently yielding 5%. So that's quite attractive. So a business that's certainly worth consideration, but be aware that it's not a dirt cheap business because of these positive uh, trends that we've been discussing. Chris Batchelor, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks, Phil. As always, great to be with you. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 